looking for. And there we go. Wow. Okay, let's start again. Um, hi, everyone. I am Sally Chamis, and I am with the Dynamic Body Work Academy. And this is our third attempt at getting this webinar going this evening, but hopefully this is the last one. Third time lucky, right? Um, so if you're joining us this evening, you should be here for the Thoracic Outlet Syndrome webinar. Um, so let's get started. I'll try not to keep too much of your time since we're already running a little bit late. But as I said earlier, if you do have to step out and miss some of the webinar, don't worry. Um, there will be a replay of this that I will be sending out tomorrow along with the notes um, that I present to you this evening. So you can always come back and watch it at another time um, or go through the notes if you prefer to do that. All right, so let's get started. Um, again, we'll have a Q&A session further down the line. Um, so when we get to that point, if you have any questions, if you just pop them in the little chat window and I will pick them up and hopefully get some answers for you. All right, so hopefully this doesn't cause any problems this time, but let's switch over to the slides and get started. Okay, so here we are, the Bodywork Academy, Understanding Thoracic Outlet Syndrome. Uh, presented by me, Sally Chamis, and the Dynamic Bodywork Academy. Now this is part of our advanced techniques for conditions of the neck course. No, again, just like thoracic outlet, it's another big mouthful. Um, we will try and find a way of shortening the name of that course. So um, if you do decide to join us on that course, again, it's advanced techniques or conditions of the neck. Um, but tonight we're going to teach you all about thoracic outlet syndrome and hopefully give you some information that you can take away and implement into your practice straight away. Um, so we're going to cover what exactly is thoracic outlet syndrome, which I will refer to most of the time this evening as TOS. Um, and then we're going to look at the anatomy and physiology of the neck. Um, we are going to look at how to identify and assess thoracic outlet syndrome, um, how to build a treatment plan for thoracic outlet syndrome. So there we're going to actually look at um, the types of techniques that you can use in your practice and specifically what muscles you're going to be working on. And then we're going to look at um, preventing thoracic outlet syndrome um, as information that you can share with your client, but also things that you can think about as a therapist um, and look at hoping to prevent thoracic outlet syndrome in your own um, body with your own body mechanics. All right. So... What is thoracic outlet syndrome? Well, thoracic outlet syndrome occurs when there's compression of the veins, arteries, and nerves in the neck and the shoulder, um, specifically the subclavian vein, the artery, or the thoracic nerves. Compression can be neural or vascular, and the symptoms can vary depending on the location of compression or the structures involved. So there are going to be multiple sites um, where compression of those nerves can occur, and specific, specific symptoms um, relate to where those nerves are actually impinged. Um, the most common neurogenic signs occur when there's compression of the lower trunk of the brachial plexus, leading symptoms such as pain, numbness, in the medial arm and hand, the upper extremity fatigue, and it can also create muscle atrophy. So first let's look at the scaling triangle or the thoracic outlet as it's most commonly known as. So here we have, if you can see my little um, pointer here, hopefully I can point out some things that we're looking at. So here's a nice picture of the thoracic outlet here. Um, so we've got the main muscles involved in TOS, which are the scaling. So here, if you see my little pointer moving around, this is your anterior scaling muscle. Um, and then here we have the middle scaling muscle. And the reason this is often called the scaling triangle is because that nice triangular shape there that it creates. Um, we don't have the uh, posterior scaling pictured here but it would be just behind the middle scaling muscle here. Um, and because of scalings, um, the brachial plexus, which is here, this bundle of nerves here, passes through the belly of the anterior middle scaling muscle. And if there's any tension um, in these muscles at all, 
which will cause contraction and then cause an impingement on these nerves. Um, that's where the problems start. Um, so that's why um, the scaling triangle here is the main source for thoracic outlet syndrome symptoms. Um, and so the scalings themselves, they originate up here from the transverse processes um, of C2 through C7, um, and they insert into the first and second rib. The anterior middle scalings, um, their actions are to elevate the first rib and laterally flex the neck. So in, if they're working individually, for example, if you're right, um, anterior middle scalings were to contract, that would cause your head to flex laterally um, to the same side, so to the right hand side. So if these muscles um, contract unilaterally, they will flex the neck to the same side. Um, the posterior scalings, on the other hand, they elevate the second rib and they also tilt the head to the same side. So the difference between um, the anterior and middle scalings um, so anterior middle scalings, they attach to the first rib and then posterior scalings to the second rib. Um, and normally uh, those are the muscles that are um, involved in forced inhalation. So um, an example of that would be, you know that really ugly cry that you get when you're really upset and you're really crying your heart out and you have those big heavy gulping sobs where you go... <laughs> and you're trying to catch your breath while you're crying, those are normally the actions um, of the scaling. So those kind of cries, when we're raising those ribs up, um, that's when your scaling's kind of trigger and go into action. There are obviously other um, smaller uh, movements where they're involved in the, your day, day movement, especially stabilization of the neck. But the, the most obvious example of this elevation of the ribs would be uh, during forced inhalation. Um, so also, to, one of the things I like to point out when we're teaching this class and looking at the um, anatomy is that the actual attachment points here on the first and second rib, uh, they run underneath the clavicle. So you may find people um, experience thoracic outlet issues or problems with their scalings if they're being found with the clavicle, um, specifically in injuries such as whiplash, where um, the clavicle may have been moved or broken um, because of the seatbelt. So any um, kind of seatbelt impacts uh, are prone to cause injuries and issues in this particular area. Um, so again, we're talking about thoracic outlet syndrome, which focuses on um, impingement issues of the brachial plexus. So obviously, the brachial plexus um, uh, consists of the cervical nerves C3 through 6, um, but also you can see here that the subclavian artery also passes through the belly of those muscles. So it's obviously a long-term um, long -term contraction of these muscles. Um, or impingement of this area could be um, very debilitating, especially if it's causing um, any kind of blockage of this axillary or subclavian artery. So let's move on and have a look at the brachial plexus itself. So this is the brachial plexus, um, and it's responsible for the cutaneous and muscular innervation of the entire upper limb, with the only exception being uh, the trapezius. As you can see from this diagram, depending on the location of the impingement, it would depend on the symptoms that the, that the client is experiencing. Um, as the brachial plexus passes between the scalings, um, it is a complete bundle where all of these trunks are kind of wrapped together in a big, thick, heavy bundle. Um, uh, it's only when uh, it passes through and it divides up into the divisions and cords that we're able to identify more specific conditions. As an example, thoracic outlet syndrome is um, quite regularly mistaken for carpal tunnel. 
because the symptoms that you experience with carpal tunnel are pain, numbness and tingling into the hand. Um, however, very specific fingers where thoracic outlet syndrome, it also causes pain, numbness and tingling into the arms and hands. So um, they've found that quite a high number of uh, surgeries that have been performed on people to relieve them of carpal tunnel um, pain and discomfort. Um, they found that after they've had the surgery, uh, the surgery hasn't worked because the pain still continues. Um, and it's only later that um, they can often identify that it was actually um, thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, obviously, this isn't in all cases, but there are many cases, particularly from the brown um, hand surgery um, specialists in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where all their job is, um, the N and D out, is to work on the, the hand um, and the carpal area. They do surgeries in D in and D out, um, and they were the actual, um, the brown uh, hand clinic was the, were the people who released this information, showing that um, carpal tunnel uh, surgery um, often doesn't work and the reason is because it can be sometimes misdiagnosed as thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, so if you do have a little look here at this image, um, what you can see here is how the cords actually do divide up um, into the different muscles here. So there's a radial nerve part of that posterior cord and then on this medial cord here this medial cord is what will um, divide up into the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. Um, since we kind of talked a little bit about um, carpal tunnel um, and we're talking about the different nerves here, the median nerve and the radial nerve, if there is compression on either of those, um, that tends to be where um, you would get the pain numbness and um, tingling on the radial side of the hand. So that's your thumb and forefinger and half of your middle finger. If any of these fingers are affected, then that these are the particular parts of um, the nervous system or particular parts of the brachial plexus that are seeing impingement. Whereas if it is the pinky and the ring finger and then that ulnar side of the middle finger, then that's the ulnar nerve that's seeing impingement. Okay, so let's have a look at the symptoms of thoracic outlet. Um, the most obvious one is pain, numbness and tingling um, down the arm and hand and sometimes in the thoracic region as well. So sometimes in that kind of neck and chest area, uh, leading down into the arm and hand. But specifically with thoracic outlet syndrome, it's the whole hand that experiences um, these symptoms rather than specific fingers. Um, clients experiencing uh, symptoms of TOS may also see um, upper extremity fatigue. So they may find that um, they find it very difficult to raise their arm up just because it feels tired and heavy. They may experience some muscle atrophy. Um, and they may also complain of reduced grip strength. Um, that's one of the questions that I do tend to ask during consultation or assessment is whether their, um, their mobility is affected by um, bearing weight. So if they were to grip something or grip something heavy, do they, were they able to grip it successfully? If they were, um, were they able to successfully complete a range of movement with that weight in their hand? Um, obviously it's a light weight, we wouldn't use anything too heavy, but it's just to assess how that particular limb would be impacted um, by this condition. So what are the primary causes of thoracic outlet syndrome? Um, so one of the main causes is excessive shoulder girdle depression. So that is generally when we have some kind of heavy load on our shoulder pulling our shoulder down in a way which would then cause um, those muscles to be overstretched but that would then shorten the gap between the belly of the muscle rather than contracting around the um, the brachial plexus we're stretching it out it's a bit like trapping something between two pieces of rubber as you pull the rubber tighter it's going to 
pull tighter onto whatever's in between it. Um, so that, that would be things like carrying heavy bags on one shoulder um, repetitively, um, an overdeveloped pesius and neck musculature. So that's where the compression side comes in as far as um, muscle contraction. So if the muscles are overdeveloped and they're contracting constantly, they're again going to reduce the space between the bellies of those muscles, reducing the space that the brachial plexus has to rest in. And obviously if that becomes cramped and tight, it's going to start causing an impingement on the brachial plexus. Um, another uh, primary cause of thoracic outlet syndrome are activities that require repetitive overhead use in the upper extremities. Um, so that would be something like if you're dealing with a lot of painters and decorators, um, people who do work up in the ceiling, who are constantly looking above and have their arms raised above their head. Um, so tennis and golfers, tennis players and golfers um, could develop the symptoms due to um, either greater muscle development of their dominant arm or an increased scapula depression just through the movements that they're performing um, while taking part in these activities. Um, swimmers, um, they can often experience this due to um, hypertrophy of the pec minor. Um, so, and also swimmers, especially if they're doing front crawl, they have a lot of repetitive movement where their arm is above their head and moving above their head a lot. And that again um, can cause a reduction in the space between the bellies of the muscles um, and an impingement on the brachial plexus. Okay, so testing for thoracic outlet or TOS. Um, there are a lot of different tests that can be performed um, to help identify thoracic outlet. This includes ADSENSE test, costal clavicular test, Halstead maneuver, right test, and Allen maneuver. However, each of these tests actually requires the palpation of the radial nerve um, before you begin the actual test itself and you're going to um, palpate and monitor the radial nerve and because we're not um, medical professionals this is generally considered out with our scope of practice. So we're going to stick with um, a relatively simple um, albeit uh, um, a little bit uh, bizarre um, which is called the ruse test. So Ruse test, you have the client um, stand and they're going to abduct their shoulders to 90 degrees. They're going to externally rotate the shoulders um, and flex the elbow to 90 degrees. Uh, when the patient or client opens and closes their hands slowly for three minutes, um, the test is positive if the patient or client is unable to complete the test or experiences heaviness, numbness, tingling or pain. So what I'm going to do now is, I'm not going to do it for three minutes, but I am going to switch back just to let you see what it, the client is actually doing because that description um, sometimes may not um, read very well. So I am going to stop screen sharing and hopefully when you all see me, I will um, wave my hands like an idiot and let you see this test. Okay, so there we go. Hi. Hopefully you can all see me again. Obviously, I haven't uh, edited my slides as much as I should have, and uh, I still um, have patient listed in there, which uh, we're allowed to use the term patient sometimes, and sometimes we're not, and in this case, we're not. So um, I should have been changing it to clients. My apologies for that. But now that you can see me, um, I'm going to hopefully, I don't know if I'll stand up and do it, but I'm going to show you what we're doing with our arms. So I'll come to the side so you can see my uh, big jelly arm doing this. So basically, um, we're going to abduct our shoulders to 90 degrees. We're going to externally rotate. And basically, this is the position that we want. We want a nice straight line right across the shoulder there, that nice 90 degree angle. Um, and then all I'm going to do, if I tilt this up so you can see it, is we're going to have them open and close our fist like this. So pull back down. So you've got that nice, as a 90 degree angle there, 90 degree angle here, and then you've got them opening and closing the wrist like this. Now, um, as the slide says, they want you to do this for three minutes. 
Um, I am definitely not going to be continuing to do this for three minutes because I know for a fact I have a little bit of a neck issue with this particular arm and shoulder and I definitely wouldn't be able to keep this up for three minutes but this is it this is all you're going to ask them to do if they uh, struggle to do it for the three minutes if you start to see a, a droop in the arm or if they do experience any um, extreme pain or discomfort while performing that test um, then that would be considered a positive um, result and you would then go on and assess the muscle and create a treatment plan for thoracic outlet syndrome. Now I just showed you with the one arm but you'd actually have them do both at the same time um, and that would also help you identify whether one was experiencing more problems than the other. You would hopefully be able to identify the healthier arm uh, and shoulder um, compared to the other one. All right so hopefully you get that and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to switch back to the slides, the badly uh, edited slides but I will switch back and uh, we will move on again. All right, so we talked about the ruse test and I just demonstrated that for you. So now let's have a look at actually treating thoracic outlet. So um, when we're treating thoracic outlet, what we wanted to do is we want to um, focus the treatment on restoring posture and muscular balance of the upper trunk and shoulder girdle. So we want to try and get the client as much back to um, muscular balance um, and get them back to as good a posture as possible. Um, the muscles that we're going to assess um, when we are having a look, we're looking for any type of contraction or any type of muscle tension that would affect their um, posture at all. Uh, primarily, we're looking for um, anything in the scalenes and pec minor. Now, if there is an imbalance in the scalenes, what we're going to see is we're going to see that the head is going to um, be flexed to either one side or the other. There's going to be just that slight or it could be severe just depending on the tension itself but we're going to look at when they're in a natural um when you ask them to either just kind of stand up in an anatomical position or have them stand up um, what they feel is nice and relaxed you're looking for the head tilting to one side or the other um, and then when pec minor what we're looking for is we're actually looking for rounded shoulders um, if pec minor is tight it's going to pull those shoulders in now, um, often, particularly uh, females, if they're larger chested, um, they will have that rounded shoulder um, posture all the time. So by opening up that chest, we're, we're going to help them with that posture and hopefully relieve them of some of these thoracic outlet syndromes. That's also one of the reasons why um, there is a condition uh, that women often get during pregnancy that they call um, pregnancy related carpal tunnel and the reason it's pregnancy related is because as the women's body changes during pregnancy and their chest enlarges preparing for the baby that tends to pull on those shoulders um, impinge on those nerves that will run through pec minor um, and create carpal tunnel um, symptoms in the arms and hands uh, so if you're dealing with, um, if you do pregnancy massage and you have a client that experiences uh, the carpal tunnel type syndromes, then um, you know that it's related to that rounded shoulder posture uh, and it's coming from tension um, and contraction in the pec minor. The secondary muscles that we're going to look at um, when assessing thoracic outlet are the trapezius muscle. Uh, serratus anterior, the biceps and triceps and the forearm flexor. So we're going to come all the way down the arm. We're not just going to look at the shoulder itself when we're um, assessing the muscles but we're going to come right down into the arm as well as the pain, numbness and tingling will continue um, down into the arm and hand. Um, so when we're building a treatment plan 
for thoracic outlet syndrome, we want to perform massage and soft tissue mobilization so that we can re relieve any of the muscle tension and tightness um, of the affected structures. Again, primarily in the scalenes um, and the pec minor. We want to perform some passive or manual stretching um, and some myofascial techniques into the scalenes, pec minor, pec major, the suboccipitals, levator scapula, and the upper trapezius. Um, you can sometimes do scapular mobilization as well. However, you might find that this is indicated if the client um, has experienced extreme limited range of motion of that shoulder itself. So if you're in the very acute stages um, after there's been an accident or injury and they uh, are struggling with any mobilization in their shoulder, then you definitely don't want to perform any scapular mobilization. So stick with um, your passive stretching, make it very gentle. You don't want to take it to the point of any um, extreme discomfort, but just on that nice sweet spot between feeling a stretch and a, just a slight um, little bit of discomfort, right at that end point. Um, positional release and craniosacral therapy. Um, are also good treatments to perform if you're qualified in any of those um, and they're really really good for aiding in the recovery of thoracic outlet syndrome but what you want to do um, when you're building your treatment plan is you want to start from uh, these primary muscles which are the scalings and the pecs um, I would start off um, with the scalings, any time I'm trying to address uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, you can do um, soft tissue release, you can do um, passive stretching, you can do uh, muscle stripping on these muscles, um, you can do some uh, pincer palpation, so some compression on these muscles. Um, each of those are great techniques to um, perform on the scalings and what your aim is to again create balance between the scalings on the left and the right hand side of the body you want those nice and balanced but you're also wanting if they um, are experiencing contraction if it's a contraction issue that is causing the impingement of the brachial plexus then you want those muscles to relax and release so you want to get them nice and relaxed um, so that they're not um, compressing that bundle of nerves. If it's from um, the extreme depression of the uh, shoulder girdle, so it's that stretch, if they're overstretched, then what you want to do is you want to create a little bit of strength to try and help bring that shoulder back up. Again, it's all about balance. If you're going to... Um, stretch one side of the body you want to strengthen the other side you also want to work in opposites so if it's overstretched you want to strengthen it to bring that shoulder back up and then you probably want to do a little bit of stretching on the opposite side just to create that balance um, when you are working with a client with TOS especially if you can visibly see that there is um, an imbalance it's always good to perform the assessment, then create your treatment plan, go through your treatment, and then after the treatment, you want to assess again to see if there's been any change in the posture um, or any visible change in those muscle structures. And that will allow you to um, kind of work out how frequently you want to see the client um, or how many times you, may, you feel that you may need to see them. Uh, generally, when I'm working with a client with a, a specific condition that they want to have treated, I ask them to give me maybe three to four sessions. I say I ask, um, basically say, uh, give me three sessions if you don't feel that there has been any improvement or any significant improvement in the condition at all or in your range of motion um, during that time then we can reassess and possibly consider um, referring out to an older practitioner. So it's always handy to have, especially for, um, for example, if you felt that maybe the client would benefit from craniosacral therapy, but it's not something that you perform, it may be handy to uh, try and locate someone in your area who does 
perform that type of treatment so that if you wanted to refer out to them um, and you didn't feel that the client was um, progressing as well as they should during the treatments that you've offered, then it's always good to um, have some numbers on hand so you can uh, refer out if need be. Okay. So preventing thoracic outlet syndrome. Um, it's really difficult to prevent something that can often be caused by uh, accident or injury. But there are some things that we can do to try and minimize the likelihood of experiencing the symptoms of thoracic outlet. Um, so you want to try and minimize any overhead activities, um, especially for extended periods of time. Obviously, if you've got to paint your ceiling, you've got to paint your ceiling. But um, you don't want to decide, I'm going to paint the ceiling in the living room, in the kitchen, in the hallway, um, and then just take it on yourself to, to spend days and days back to back, constantly with your arms above your head, um, doing that type of action, because then you're definitely going to um, increase the likelihood that you'll experience some of these symptoms. Um, be aware of your head and shoulder posture. Um, you want to reduce instances of sleeping prone. The reason for that is if you're sleeping prone, nine, unless it's on the massage table that has a face cradle, nine times out of ten, you're going to have either one or both arms above your head um, just for comfort and for to feel natural. So having your arms above your head like that for extended periods of time are going to cause... Um, uh, reduced space in that shoulder area is going to cause those muscles to tense up and uh, again it's going to cause impingement in that thoracic outlet. So try and reduce um, uh, how often you actually sleep like that. Um, someone who's overweight can exacerbate um, TOS symptoms because of the weight on their body so if um, it's something that they've experienced for a long time uh, it may be something that they want to consider um, as a reason for uh, addressing their weight issue. But being overweight will certainly not help uh, any of these symptoms if you experience them. Um, avoid carrying heavy bags over your shoulder, especially if you're only doing it on one side. If you repeatedly carry heavy bags on just the one shoulder, you're going to create that um, forced depression of the shoulder that's going to cause that rubber band effect with the scalings, pinching them down on that brachial plexus. Um, other ways to uh, try and reduce the chances of experiencing these symptoms are to um, uh, stretch daily or stretch often, perform exercises that will keep your shoulder muscles nice and strong, uh, but you don't want to overwork those muscles or those neck muscles. Um, so let's see we're going okay what i'm going to do is i'm going to switch back and just show uh, or talk to you about a few stretches that you might be able to use as therapists to help open up uh, the chest and neck area and hopefully prevent you from experiencing any of these symptoms in your practice so let me switch back real quick all right there we go hi um hopefully you can see me now I uh, just a quick shout out to Caroline and to Trevor for joining us. Nice to see you guys on board. Thank you for hopping on the webinar this evening. You've missed all the fun from earlier, all the problems that we had, but we're good to go now. All right, so uh, a few stretches um, that we can perform for ourselves. The first one, you're not going to really be able to see me doing it much, but what you want to do is when you're uh, at home uh, or even at the office and you've got some downtime and you're sitting on a chair, you want to have you know, a nice and sturdy chair that you're sitting on, you want to take your hand and you want to just slide that up under your bum there. So you're sitting on your hand, it's going to be palm up, so you're going to sit on the palm of your hand, but you want to have that nice straight shoulder line across there. Your arm's going to be nice and relaxed. But now you're sitting on your hand, you're creating a little bit um, of an anchor so that it can help with the stretch. So once you're sitting on it, all you want to do is you're just going to drop your head to the opposite side. And then once you've got it dropped here and you feel a little bit of a stretch, you're going to rotate your nose down. 
and that's going to get to those posterior muscles. And then what you can also do is you can rotate it up and that's going to stretch out those anterior and middle scalene muscles. So that's a nice stretch for you to do. You can do that on both sides just to stay nice and balanced. So rotate down when you feel the stretch. Come back to the center. Rotate up. Um, another one that you can do um, to kind of open up the neck area, and this is one I really, really like um, that doesn't get done too often, and this is to kind of stretch the platysma. So what you're going to look for, um, you're going to place your hands just underneath your collarbone there. My collarbone there. Place your hands down there. It's not too hard, but just a nice firm contact. And once you've got the contact, what you're going to do is you're just going to lift your head up. And you should see and feel that nice stretch right across the neck there. And if you anchor it at different points, you're going to get right across that platysma. So you can come all the way across the clavicle, just pinning and stretching. And that will open up that neck area. If you feel that just by tilting your head, you're not getting a very good stretch, just stick your chin out like this. And that'll create that nice tight stretch up there. So that's really good for opening up the neck as a therapist. If you want to open up your chest, the best stretch that you can do is just to get that nice 90 degree angle. And what I would do is I would do it in the door jam. So I would just have this part of my arm pressed up against the door. And once it's pressed up against the door, you're just going to rotate away. And that's going to open up right here. And that's a great way to open up those shoulders. So again, nice 90 degree angle up here that I'll show you so you can see if you can see it. So here's something I can brace myself against. So pretend this is the door. You just stick your um, arm up there against and then just rotate away. And that's getting that nice stretch in there to open up those shoulders. So those are some stretches that you can do on a daily basis. Um, uh, maybe before you start work and then just at the end of your shift at the clinic, uh, just to keep those, um, that your chest and your neck and your shoulders all nice and loose um, and open up for uh, the prevention of thoracic outlet syndrome. So we'll just switch back to the presentation real quick. Let me see. All right. So, does anyone have any questions about any of that? Um, if you do, there is a little chat window underneath. Just type your question away. Um, I will say, uh, again, if you missed any of this webinar at all tonight, there will be a replay available. I will get that sent out to everyone. Um, that will be sent out tomorrow. Uh, I'll also send out the notes, this little presentation, the, the slides from this presentation. I'll add those to the webinar as well. So no one any questions so far? Wow, you guys are great. Well, if you do have questions, and I either miss them, or if you do have questions that kind of come to mind while you're watching the replay, uh, you can always uh, contact me at sally at dynamicbodywork.co.uk. So that's sally at dynamicbodywork.co.uk. And I will gladly chat with you and hopefully answer any questions that you ha may have about thoracic outlet syndrome. So since there are no questions coming up, I'll just kind of move on um, and just tell you that the presentation tonight was um, taken from um, a class that we're running called the Advanced Techniques for Conditions of the Neck. The next class for this will run um, at our Belper location in Derbyshire, which is on Sunday, May 17th, and the class will start at 10 a.m. 
uh, for putting up with me babbling this evening on the webinar. Um, you can use a discount code of TOS webinar on our booking page um, and you'll receive £30 off. And that deal is uh, valid until May 2nd. So you've got a few days. If you are watching this webinar on a replay, you can still uh, take up this discount code to join us at the um, May 17th class. Um, and to sign up, if you just go to dynamicbodywork.co.uk, you'll see the very first class listed on there is the um, advanced techniques for conditions of the neck. If you want to keep in touch with us, our website again is dynamicbodywork.co.uk. Uh, the general email account is info at dynamicbodywork.co.uk. But again, if you want, uh, want any assistance from me specifically or have any questions for me at all you can email me again at sally at dynamicbodywork.co.uk we are also on facebook if you're not already there um, just uh, go to facebook.com uh, forward slash dynamic bodywork or you can just do a little search on facebook for dynamic bodywork and we'll come up if you're on twitter our twitter username is dynamic bw um, and if you're on instagram or you can find us under Dynamic Bodywork. That's a really good one. We've started uploading pictures from our classes um, and just sharing some images of the day to day um, runnings, uh, kind of behind the scenes view of uh, us putting together course material, of the taking pictures for the manuals and just um, some little snaps of the manuals and stuff. So um, we'd love to meet you on any of these uh, social media platforms. We'd love to hear from you if you have any input in regards to um, the webinar this evening or if there are any other webinars that you would really like us to put on for you in regards to the massage industry, then please, please um, drop me an email. I'm always looking for uh, new webinar material. Uh, and again, uh, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Um, I hope it hasn't been too painful for everyone. Um, but I'm really looking forward to hearing from you guys. Uh, just let me know what you thought of the webinar. I'd love to get some feedback if you would like us to keep doing some of these or if there's things that you think are missing and would like us to include uh, in the future. Please let us know. All right. So now you get to see me again. Hi. Uh, just for me to wave goodbye. Um, again, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, thanks to Joanne and Joe. You guys have been there and put up with me during all those technical difficulties the first 10, 15 minutes or so. So thank you so much for uh, staying with me and uh, surviving to the end of the webinar through all those technical difficulties. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Kay and Trevor. Um, hello there, Anka. I'm not sure when you popped on, but thank you for joining me as well. And thank you to everyone else who um, has joined us this evening or this webinar, but been maybe been a little bit too shy to hop on the chat. So thank you, and I hope to see you um, soon on one of our courses. Have a good evening.